Look, can we talk about Suman? I hope so, because we need to. He is what? He's all right. I don't, I don't know how he is at taking compliments, but let me just say this out loud first. It's been weighing on me. He is really a handsome dude. <laughs> I mean, he that is so a not where I thought you were going next, dude. <laughs> that happens to be true. That I just, to I'm be true. looking at him. I'm like, wow, like that. I, I can imagine if he was like, I would. Yeah, he's just so charming. He's so yep. charming. He he is, and with those ancient black eyes, they're just oh, God. beautiful dude. Wields, he wields his charm like a superpower, like a <laughs> scimitar. I, I just get lost in that episode hearing him speak. Uh, let's talk, but, but more importantly, you've known him for a long, long time. Yeah, nice long and, time. Yeah, and so let's talk about a little bit about that relationship and what, what kind of stuff you've learned from him. Let's definitely talk about that. So a, uh, a, a kind of a seer, intuitive sort of person uh, who was um, part of the earliest iteration of the Lotus Center um, called me up at one point and said, I think you need to meet a guy. And I said, awesome. Who, who do you have in mind? She said, you know, I honestly think he may be one of the most advanced souls I've ever encountered. And I was like, goodness, you don't ever say things like that. I would like to meet this guy for sure. Mm-hmm. So I get together with him, and he's an awesome guy. We um, had some lunch and went to a yoga class I was planning on going to anyway. Um, and I have to say is I'd never seen anyone do yoga quite like him because it's so quiet. Like there was none of this wrestling around and, you know, shaking things out between moves. Like he would be in a pose and hold it and then very, very simply and quietly move to the next one and hold it. And he just, he looked completely relaxed the whole time. And I was like, all right, so the dude's got some yoga chops. I get that. And then the next time we hang out, might have even been later that day. Maybe we just kept on hanging out. Um, We we decided we want to go see a movie, right? And and nobody else in our lives wanted to go see The Passion of the Christ, the Mm -hmm. Mel Gibson. Oh, you guys have known each other a long time. Yeah, right. This was was back when everybody liked Mel Gibson. I know, this is a while back. And so we decided we'd go see it. And for those who don't know, um, like it's a it's a very intense portrayal of the last days of Jesus's life, including the, you know, the whipping and the abuse and the crucifixion and the whole thing. Uh, And Mel Gibson really wanted to beat you over the head with it as a director. And so he made sure it was pretty gruesome and gory. Um, And so for me, Though I, I really wanted to see that for all kinds of reasons, it did involve having my feet up on the chair in front of me and kind of, you know, watching some of this movie between my knees a little bit. Like, did he eat popcorn real quiet? So he eat popcorn real quiet, and so so there's just a lot of like you're you're watching a guy getting whipped on on screen, and for me that involves some wincing and some you know closing of one eye, and occasionally when it got bad enough, turning to one side or the other for a moment to just look away. So I had occasion to look at my movie going partner next to me and see his reaction. And he's sitting with both feet on the floor, and his palms are just kind of comfortably open and face up in his lap didn't look awkward it just seemed he's like he could make that meditative pose sort of look completely normal um yeah and and so i'd look back at the movie and then i'd look at him again and then i started to notice like i'm hearing like whip 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 on the screen and i'm not even seeing the tiniest eye movements in suman's face to show kind of that wince that we all do when we're we're kind of resisting or reacting to or flinching right i mean there wasn't anything and i watch faces for a living so believe me i can catch the real subtle stuff nothing so at one point i felt a little irritated i was like well come on is he kind of a robot like how in the world is he not feeling anything this is ridiculous um and then i look back another time when again i'm trying to look away from the screen for a moment and i see he's still sitting there without flinching his hands are still open in his lap And there are these big, beautiful tears running down his face. And he's clearly profoundly moved by this movie. And yet nothing in him is resisting what he's seeing the way I am all over the place. And at that Mm -hmm. point, I was like, wow, I really want to know how he got there. And it's been this deep friendship ever since. We've 
shared lots of clients and patients. We've um, been great friends for a long time. We've studied lots of things together, including a lot of Tai Chi and Kung Fu and Wing Chun and uh, Qigong, like, like lots of stuff. And just hundreds of conversations like the one that we finally got recorded right there about, mm -hmm. you know, the deeper nature of things and comparative spirituality and so forth like that. And along the way, uh, Sophia and I asked him to be Benji's godfather because he is just such a lovely example of an open kind of spirituality that is the God connectedness that, you know, I would I would want for him. Mm -hmm. So it's been a really lovely friendship knowing Suman. So uh, given that this was the first recorded documentation of these uh, conversations of legend, uh, how do you how do you feel <laughs> like you did? Well, um, do you mean me or us? Both of you, yeah. Both of us. How'd it go? Um, I felt really good about it. I, uh, yeah. I, I was kind of curious to know, like, how this impacted other people. It helped me that just a moment ago I got to hear from Andy that, of course, he'd heard it in the editing process and he really liked it. Like, he, he followed well and he felt like we conveyed what we wanted to convey well. And it's a... It's a really beautiful, really precious process that I would want to do justice for. Yeah, yeah. Especially because, I mean, truly, it is the quintessential paradox of change. Like, Vipassana is, it's a discipline in doing absolutely nothing about right. the very things you most want to change right in the moment, right? So there you are sitting there, um, and here comes an itch. And the idea is, what if I let it pass for once? What if I don't scratch it like I always do? I just let it go. And here comes my foot falling asleep. What if I let that peak and rise and drive me stark raving mad for just a minute and then find, oh, nope, I haven't actually lost my mind. Oh, weird. It passes too. And here it yeah. comes and here goes hunger. Here comes and there goes drowsiness, right? Like, it's a really fascinating process, and along the way, what's changed in not just the person or the, let's say, soul, but in the body itself is extraordinary. I, of course, uh, it that's the thing that stuck with me, the itch first, and it's been growing the awareness of uh, my experience in trying to rectify the universe around me. And make it fit into to my whims, yeah. uh, and no place more <laughs> apparent than in the hot box. Have I told you? I've told you about my hot box, right? Tell me more about sauna. Oh, no the sauna. Say more about. Oh, we sauna? got a sauna. Well, you know, it's all the health stuff, the vascular stuff I'm dealing with. So we uh, we and the doctor agreed I should get a sauna. So uh, I, Kira, my wife, you know, went about found this fantastic sauna. It's one of the zip-up kind, you know, you put it in your room, it's portable, it's like made out of that heat resistant or heat insulating kind of fabric and you sit in it and it's infrared, you turn it on so it's quote a dry sauna and your head sticks out of the top <laughs> and you have these little armholes that stick out, but inside is 150 degrees and I just sit in there for an hour and I have I was using this to you know watch movies as i do uh, but after <laughs> this interview with suman i found myself thinking i wonder i wonder i wonder if i could just sit for an hour and experience it and you get by the the first half hour is fine because it takes it 25 minutes to even get up to temperature and then you start sweating and you start sweating from everywhere. You start sweating from the tips of your brow, and it just drops these long drops of sweat down your face, down your neck, down your back. The sweat is, it, it becomes a thousand feathers as, it, as, as toxins e erupt from you, right? <laughs> right? It's just, it is extraordinary. And I, it, it, I found it the most, the most illuminating effort to do nothing to let it let myself exist in that space of a thousand feathers and see if if suman was right because really it's my place to test him <laughs> right <laughs> you have to though uh, 
but it turns out it yeah, after it, I couldn't do it the first day. I couldn't do it at all. I just I just my brain was it would just uh, I would get too sidetracked and I'd be scratching and itching and tell the second day uh, got a little easier. And the, by the third day, I found myself being able to to watch in my mind's eye individual drops of sweat as they would come down my shoulder or something and and then let it pass and let it absorb into the towel I'm sitting on or whatever. And, and I didn't believe it. Wow. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that I could sit there. And I was like, I, it got to the point where I was feeling super cocky about the whole thing. <laughs> sweat drop. Bite me, sweat drop. I got your number. You know, right. like I was just, I was feeling really weirdly exuberant about my experience of having that of of being being able to have that kind of control over my lived experience. Yes. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes complete sense. Pema Chodron's way of saying it is if you think about it, the instruction's really simple and almost impossible. It's yes. just stay. Yeah. Just stay. Don't let your brain go everywhere else. Don't leave your body again and ignore it some more. Don't go into some distraction so that you don't have to deal with the fact that, oh, dear God, I might be hot. Or sweating, right. or uncomfortable, right. heaven forbid, right? Just stay, just stay. And and you, I'm, and an even simpler example, I'm embarrassed to say, is see what it's like if you just taste your food, like really taste it, like to the point where. Uh, so when I spent time in India, um, you weren't washing it down with water. You weren't talking to anyone else. They asked you just to close your eyes for every bite and put your hand back in your lap. Don't start shoveling the next one, getting it all ready to go while you chew the first one. Just yeah. actually taste your food. You start doing that and you get into the sensations of the food and the sound of the food. And it's immensely pleasurable. So much so you almost can't stand it. You have to, you have to kind of get used to how wonderful it is because you want to escape that too. Yeah. It's really strange. So Vipassana becomes this way to practice staying in that way that then becomes like you can watch a movie with your heart wide open and instead of spending the whole time writhing in your seat like Dodge is, by the way, that would have been, let's see, that was maybe, if it was 20 years ago, I'd already been meditating by for 11 years of my life. It was it might have been less. Yep, 2004. Okay, so I'd been meditating by then for uh, 15 years of my life. Um, and I'm the guy who's writhing around in the seat and not and I'm finding it hard to be in his heart because I can't even be in my body, right? This, this is something is I'm, I've been curious about thing. That specifically. And I think this ties into uh, maybe my question. If it's a, if it's a good question, <laughs> then it ties into our conversation with Nikki Kinzer and ADHD, because one of the things that I struggle with so much is context, context switching and, uh, you know, moving from one state to another state, from one activity to another activity. I get sort of addicted to what I'm doing right now, and it makes me very cranky when I have to shift. And so um, I find the same thing in meditation where I can be I, I can have a really solid and consistent meditation practice. And when I am meditating, I'm all in it. I'm all present. And when I am not, I am very far from it. I'm like a different person. And my experience of just watching Suman interact with the universe through Zoom and interact with you is that he is a person who exists wholly in himself, no matter what he's doing. Yeah. And and isn't that the most aspirational bit? Does that have any any resonance for you? Oh my gosh, yes. That's absolutely the aspirational bit. I I often tell a story about witnessing something between the head teacher of my Tai Chi school and one of the more advanced students, uh at least one who was well ahead of me. Um the student was saying to the teacher, "Hey, I think I passed you on the way over here." And the teacher said, "Yes, I saw you too." And the student said, you drive a such and such. And the guy nodded. There was a little pause. And then the teacher said something like, can I tell you um, 
what I thought as I saw you pass? And the guy said, yes. And he said really gently, and I hope I can convey that well. He just said, I saw you gripping your steering wheel and leaning forward and driving a little faster maybe than you needed to. And I thought, ah, he's learning the form well, but it hasn't taken yet. Ah, yeah. And that's such a beautiful statement because, right, like so many of us are doing our meditations, but they're they're like, <laughs> it's they're only context specific. I meditate over here, and then the first thing I do is jump up and, you know, stress out about something or bark an yeah. instruction to my child or something silly, right? Yeah. That doesn't make any, it isn't meditative at all, which, which helps me remember why the teachers used to say the very most important step of your, med- of your Tai Chi practice is the first step you take after you think you've finished. What's, what's that? Any well, step? It's just the step? I'd like to know the step. <laughs> right. So you've finished your form where you've moved slowly and meditatively and extremely mindfully. Do you then leave your body immediately, go back into your head, think 20 minutes down the road, jump in your car, or is your first step away from the Tai Chi floor after the form is finished as meditative as the other ones? It may not be as slow, but are you still in your body? If not, it hasn't taken yet. And that's okay. You just have to keep doing it. It takes, it takes a long time. And you're right. Sumana has a way of being much more present, which is not to say like the dude is tranced out all the time, but it does mean in this very sort of joyful way, he has a way of witnessing himself. So like we had this hilarious occasion watching football together where like every time our team would score, he would be like, oh, I'm feeling such a dopamine rush. This is wonderful. <laughs> It was just so funny. And he's, he's like making fun of himself, right? Like he's not like that yeah. ridiculous, but but he completely was just watching himself. And there was another point where during our Kung Fu training, he's sparring with our head teacher and he happens to like walk right into a punch. Like the teacher's doing a nice job of pulling these, so he's not yeah. hurting anybody. But Suman but happens to- But now when Suman rushes into it. <laughs> he ducks it right into it and, I mean, just gets clocked. And so the, the teacher has to catch him before he falls down because he is clearly- rocked yeah. and he goes to sit down and um <laughs> and his first words are oh my goodness this is a very interesting experience <laughs> <laughs> he's like still witnessing <laughs> that he's almost passing out because he just got pounded um and to this day you, our teacher yeah. loves to laugh about that because um because he's just he's just lovely that way and it, it's such an example of vipassana in his day-to-day life Okay, so how do you characterize the difference or the gap between witnessing and responding or reacting? My sense is that in witnessing, we can be there and have the full experience rather than it having us, right? So let's bring in some of our pe- the people we've been talking to all this time, right? So mm-hmm. you heard me use the phrase maybe with my brother and probably since then, maybe even with Suman, come to think of it. We either have our feelings or they have us. This is a wonderful phrase in the world of psychology, but it is absolutely Buddhism. Like, mm-hmm. um, if I if I can't have the itch, then I have to scratch it. And the analogy there is that, you know, if the itch is poison ivy, the more I scratch it, the more it spreads. Right. Right. And if it's an itch of craving, the more I gratify it, the more it spreads. If it's an itch of aversion, the more I, you know, I flee the more I find to flee. Mm -hmm. And it misses the wonderful notion of impermanence, right? Which in Dave Rico's terms, back from episode two, it's one of those five givens of life. Everything changes and ends. So the responding, I think of as different from the reacting. The reacting is the thing we do when we're busy not having the feeling. Well, and and to use the let's I, I mean I, I the reason I'm latching onto this is because of walking into a punch. Uh, if if I'm if I look at my lived experience walking into a punch, my reaction is ah, ow like immediate yeah. ow un unmetered full throttled. I just got punched and I'm going to react to it and it's going to be ow. Right. I'm not, I, I'm going to lose my wits for a minute. Right. Absolutely. Right? And there's going to be some reactive part of me if I get punched in the face that's like, 
that's that feels um, either anger or fear, yeah. a fight or flight or a freeze. Yeah. Like some part of me wants to shut down and oh my god, do I want out of there? Go right? limbic system, go right. Go yeah. exactly, total limbic yeah. hijacking. So yeah. what was different was for him, he had all that going on, and he was just curious about it. It was just the curiosity. He was just like, wow, this is a very interesting experience, right? I'm dizzy. I can't stand up just right now. Like rushing through me is this wild, crazy flood of adrenaline for a moment. And he could find it very interesting because he's willing to be curious instead of all kind of in that automated state of yeah. I must do something now that I have this. Well, willing and able, right? That That's the muscle that I feel like and 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 that's the that's the paradox in my head right that in order to do nothing you have or, or to do nothing enough to bear witness to your lived experience as he does you have it it takes an act of will and practice and consciousness to do nothing right to just stay yes. to to stay long enough to witness it rather than yeah. to, yes it, you're exactly right um because he's and able yet, to do it so quickly to get punched and stop and say, wow, I'm going to trigger that muscle instead of the reactive one. And I'm going to I'm going to be able to explore and be curious, yeah. as you say, and not just pulling my arms around like I would. And that was not always his experience by his nature. Yeah. Interestingly, he is a really willful person. Like as a mm -hmm. kid, he was a handful for his parents. Until he started meditating in his, I think it was in his early teens or younger maybe, um, where maybe that started to shift, but took some time. Like this is a long time in the making for Suman to get to where he is now. Um, and I, I can see an example of what he was like because his eldest son is much like he and uh, little Gabriel is – hilarious i mean joyful little guy but man is he headstrong and if he's not getting what he wants hello craving right mm -hmm. he's freaking furious about it right he's very yeah. and, and yeah. it's tough to redirect because he's so determined um and suman was able to take all of that and and he's been able to kind of uh apply his will to hanging in there um remember though as we talked about in this episode it only takes eight weeks before there is a visible change in your brain scan, and it's particularly your amygdala that starts to shrink. That is the reactivity. That is the fight, flight, freeze part that says, oh, hell, I got it from here. That's the one that says all blood flow leaves the front of your brain with a part that can witness, and now we're into pure primitive reaction. And as so the more that shrinks, which starts really quickly, um, the less reactive you are. And recap what it takes over those eight weeks for people to get there. Because the exercise you did was a 10-minute reflective exercise, which is fantastic. And again, just what an exemplary uh, model of doing nothing. Like, he just pretty much doesn't talk for 10 minutes. And we recorded the whole thing. And it was it was amazing. <laughs> he just sat present. I meditated. And, and I you just, meditated. It was lovely. No, I need... This is really important, too. I think people need to to know this because I was all on board for trickery. I was, I said, here, Suman, we're just in a recording session. Just record kind of the beginning and the end. If you're going to sit for 10 minutes, I'll just watch the clock when I'm editing the thing and move the end out 10 minutes. And Dodge said, nope, you're not going to do that. We're going to do it for real. And we did. We sat there in silence meditating for real. If any of you assumed that yeah. Pete won, he did not win. And it was great. It was so much better for it. Just it was there was some real mojo going on there. So anyway, yeah, there's go some ahead. real. Yes, I, I think that that's exactly right. Here are a few things that are options. Um, let's start with the ideal, um, which I know for a whole lot of people sounds like pure torture. And there's an element of it that is, I'm sure, very hard. I have not had a chance to do this because I didn't know about Vipassana retreats until after I had a child. And so um it makes, you know, it, it it's even harder as a parent to come up with 10 days when you're away from everybody and including phone calls. So the ideal would be a 10-day silent retreat where you literally are practicing a simple body scan. The first thing you do for four days is you're practicing a concentration technique. Um, and yes, everybody thinks they're going to suck at it and everybody struggles. Everybody. 
And then you move from there, you've refined that ability just enough that you can start a brain scan, I mean, a body scan process, and you stay there for the next uh, six days. And I hear it very commonly said that on day six, you feel like you are going to go absolutely start raving mad. And at some level, you do. You, you lose your mind and you finally come fully into your senses. And that's when the profound work really begins. And you get two or three years worth of meditation done in 10 days because like uh, it's a little like I'll say to people, imagine if if you're only trying to um, to toast bread, that's in and out in three minutes, no problem. If what you're trying to do is cook a turkey where you're really getting to the core of it, you can't just put it in there for three minutes at a time. All you do is brown the skin, and you've still got mm. salmonella all the way to the center of it, right? If you can get to a 10-day retreat, it's a wonderful jump start to a practice because, from what I understand, you really get through a huge chunk of stuff. Um, so then you you sit daily for years to come doing that and making – it sounds like very rapid pro- progress if, if all the studies are true – the other way to do it, though, is um, uh, you can get a teacher, including Suman. Suman's going to come finally. This is one thing we've longed to do for a long time. Suman and I have always wanted to work in the same office together, and he's finally going to come join us at the Lotus Center in its reopening here in Midtown. And he's going to teach uh, meditation here. Um, oh, that's great. So I think people can do that um, by Zoom or, uh, you know, from a distance. Um maybe even phone, I don't know. Um, and uh, and certainly we'll be able to do it in person when we're, you know, out of the COVID um, predicament. Um, so that's another way. And a third way would be perhaps uh, as simple as like finding um, meditation apps like Headspace, this is Buddhist based, or to go even to YouTube for an instructor you find who would just teach you the biggest thing is like putting in some time to just learning to s- sit for a minute and watch the nature of our reactivity. How fast I sit there and then I decide I suck at this because I had too many thoughts and now I got to chase my thoughts and I believe all my thoughts and shoot, I really need to stand up and take care of that before I sit down. What was I thinking? And maybe I should write that down. And right. I mean, like we do all this. And if for once we could say, hey, what if I don't do anything? I just watch that thought come and go. Yeah. What a relief. Yeah. What if I watch that sensation come and go? What if that big, huge feeling? Yeah. I mean, I just sit here and talk, uh, just talking to you about it. Like I find myself, um, well, we already use the word aspirational, but it just feels so much like the thing I want to do right now. Right. Yeah. The thing that I want to do, like I just even talking about it is almost too noisy. Yes. I feel like I I want to I just want to hang up on you and just go sit quietly and let the dog snooze on my lap and and be for a little bit. Yeah. I hope others are getting that experience because it doesn't and I don't I I really wouldn't want anybody to walk away from this conversation imagining that if they don't get a 10-day retreat then it's never going to take for them. Oh, yes, please don't think that. Like start. Just start anywhere. Start with 5 minutes. Start with Every time I wash the dishes this week, I'm just going to see if I can stay here with the dishes. Just wash the dishes and feel the temperature yeah. in my hand. This is the medit- This is the mindfulness aspect, right? And the Buddha's real yeah. genius was in teaching you can use a combination of concentration where you're focusing the mind while it's simultaneously aware of what's happening all through the body and in its surroundings at the same time. So we're, if you're just fully tasting your food... Or really just listening to your kid and not racing ahead in your mind. Or just cooking dinner. And that's all. You don't have the news on. You don't have extra music to soothe you. You're not having a big, long conversation. You're just being with your food. Listening to those sounds. Feeling the wooden handle of the spoon in your hand. Whatever it might be. Like, just be present for a little while. And notice, please, inevitably... You absolutely are going to leave that. That's okay. A lot of it, sort of like if I want to exercise my bicep and do a curl with a heavy weight, a 
well, I don't just hold that thing up there for the rest of forever to make my bicep strong. I let it go back down and then I start again. And every time we come back to, to now, we're strengthening that muscle. Just like every time you come back to a, a mantra, that's, that's healing. So don't worry about it. you're getting flooded with thoughts and going away. It's okay. Just practice coming back. As many times as it happens, that's fine. If you can even watch it happen, even better. This does not mean clear your mind. That's not what we're doing. That's not Vipassana. In fact, it's the opposite. It's stay present for it. Yes. Yeah. Just Be stay. ready for it. Be aware. Yep. All That's right. all. Well, he was great. I really like Simon a lot. I'm glad. Me too, I man. just need to, need to watch, need to experience. And uh, so You're nice. talking about with the Nikki interview, Worlds Colliding? Yeah. Suman's been a great friend for a long time. You've been a great friend for an even longer time. But I don't know that you've ever spent any time together. It's really just None. fun to get to yeah. introduce those two parts of my world. Yeah. It's ships in the night a little bit, but we're it's it's great to great to have that connection. This was yeah. awesome. Thanks, B. Thanks, bud. Love you, buddy. Love you. <laughs>